Welcome to the Invest with Clarity podcast, where you will learn how success in investing, as in life, is the result of absolute clarity. Mark Pearson of Nepsis in Minneapolis, Minnesota, shares his passion for portfolio management and commitment to transparency and communication to allow investors to fully understand what they own and why, bringing them to clarity in their investments. And now, here are your co-hosts, Matt Halloran and Mark Pearson. Hello and welcome to another Invest with Clarity podcast with Mark Pearson. We are in part two today of a four-part miniseries, The Four Keys to Successful Investing. The last podcast, we dove very deeply into philosophy, and today, Mark's going to talk to us about strategy. Mark, welcome to the show. Matt, always good to be with you. You know, I had such a good time talking with you about the philosophy that I'm, I'm even more excited that we're actually going to kind of lift up the hood and take a look at your overall strategy. Where do we even begin here? Well, as you know, the baseline is we refer to the four keys to successful investing. What are the four keys? Your investment philosophy and your investment strategy, flexibility, investment flexibility, and investment transparency. And obviously, we have recorded the investment philosophy component, and uh, now is the strategy. Uh, Bear in mind, if listeners have not listened to the other podcasts, I would encourage them to do so and uh, understand that the investment philosophy and strategy are your, call it your empirical slash fundamental data, Mm -hmm. and the flexibility and transparency are the behavioral aspects of investing. And we really believe that in order to, I shouldn't say in order to, I mean, lots of people have different strategies, but I really believe that the blend of your philosophy and strategy versus flexibility and transparency allows an investor to keep uh, on a steady path to stick to the process, which of course we always say process before progress. So today we do strategy. So today we Stuck do strategy. All right. So let's go ahead and yes. dive in. What let's let's talk about the cardinal tenets of of strategy itself. Sure. Well, many people will ask me, so what's your opinion about how the stock market's going to do in the next year? Of course, this is part of our investment philosophy. But to reiterate, uh, we don't <laughs> we're not in the business of prognosticating, postulating, and speculating about what a quote unquote market is gonna do over any period of time. The reality is that there are too many variables that go into a market, a stock market going up and down. And again, let me reiterate, it would be good for the listeners to go back and listen to the philosophy podcast we finished. So with that being said, because you cannot predict what's gonna happen within the markets, we always tell people, that it is fundamental analysis that is the key. In other words, looking at the businesses we own or want to own, we're not in the business of being what's called quote unquote market timers. We don't invest in the market. As you know, we invest in businesses. And so a market, quote unquote, the stock market indexes can be going up or going down But the reality is volatility creates the opportunity to buy more of a business on sale. And so we always tell our clients, there's a 100% chance that after we buy into a business for you, that the price of that stock is probably going to go down. But the movement of a stock over short periods of time is not indicative of the value of the business. So therefore, looking at day-to-day volatility, looking at day-to-day, quote unquote, value of your portfolio is frankly a futile and frankly lacks common sense to look at the value of your portfolio every day. Because as you know, Matt, we have said it a million times, you don't make money in an investment or lose money in an investment until you sell it. Right. So we're always looking at the fundamentals of the businesses we own. And we'll stick to that process as we go forward. 
All right, I want to pause you there because something that you said, uh, it's interesting because I think I've heard you say this on other shows, but uh, I'm going to add something to the fact that it's, you know, not doesn't take a lot of common sense and you shouldn't be looking at the day to day. The other thing that happens when people are micro focused on small term trends within individual stocks or markets is it's really frustrating. Uh, and sure. it's, it's, you know, I mean, part of wanting to hire a financial services professional is hopefully reducing some of that burden, that concern, that the feeling of relief that you know somebody is monitoring that so you don't have to. Uh, you commun- you've communicated that on other podcasts. Mark, I just wanted to, to add that in there. If you don't no, I appreciate that. You literally put it right on the tee for us. That, that is exactly right. Uh, you know, people become very emotional and you may have a time-tested process that you've used to invest, but the reality is the inability to manage the emotional aspects can be detrimental to the investor's success. And that way, that's why we have the four foundational components, because the idea is that if we use the four components, that we get greater stability in process, meaning it's the investor looking at the process. We've said this a million times, no one company should break your long-term portfolio. Uh, Stocks go up and down, stocks go out of business, they go bankrupt. Uh, Stocks go parabolic to the upside, which then takes you into the buy and sell discipline we'll cover here in a little bit. But the bottom line is you are correct. People, a lot of times, don't have the ability to manage the emotions, and that's why we have the other two foundational components of flexibility and transparency. You know, one of our uh, pieces we talk about often, Matt, is our, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, I'm looking for the word, the strength and the history, the uh, experience that my research committee has, my investment committee has. And two of those guys that are in my committee, one's been with me now for about 15, 16 years. The other has been with me for about 13, 14 years. And these guys have been through the thick and thin in terms of economic expansion, contraction, black swan events, uh, the financial crisis, right? COVID, uh, you know, all these different uh, experiences that we've gone through in the last 15, 20 years, they've been there. And the thing that uh, as time goes on, which makes, I think, us of greater value is the fact that we do have a process that uh, we still have our first client, for an example. And, uh, you know, as we've talked about before, we don't publish returns as part of our philosophy. We don't use benchmarks as part of our philosophy. And that's because the strategy that we use is time tested. And when you combine the philosophy and strategy together and you look at the strength of the research team, uh, that I think gives us a lot of credibility. Now, when you're talking about you, you know, and again, uh, you knowing what you own and why you own it, and every stock that is in your specific portfolio should serve a specific reason. How do you build that into your strategy? I mean, how do you look at companies and say, I think we're going to buy that for this? Wow. That's a complicated question and a very good question. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll tell you, Matt, it's hard to explain that. And I think probably the best way to explain that is to go into the next bullet point of our okay. strategy, which is the top down analysis in the bottom up analysis. Top down, of course, is taking a 30,000 foot view of what is happening around the world, what is happening economically. Do you have inflation? Do you have deflation? Do you have stagflation? Uh, The relative and absolute valuations of the businesses that you own. You know, we're going through a significant correction right now in high growth, high price to sales ratio companies, where low price to earnings ratio companies are doing much better. And this has to do with a blend of owning what is referred to in the market in a category of value stocks and the category of growth stocks. Growth stocks traditionally have a much higher price to earnings ratio. 
uh, price to sales ratio, value stocks have a tendency to have a lower price to earnings ratio, lower price to sales ratio. Many times they carry a dividend, but it all starts with every position in the portfolio, Matt, uh, looking at the top down, the bottom up analysis. I used to use the analogy all the time. Uh, when you bake a cake, you need all the ingredients. You need the flour, you need the sugar, you need the vegetable oil. You need all the ingredients to make that cake and make that cake come out properly. If you're missing one key ingredient, your ingredient, i.e. your flour or your sugar or your eggs, you can have a significant negative impact to how the cake comes out. That said, your portfolio should also be like an automobile. You know, when you get in your car and you turn the key, you expect the car to start. You don't know who makes the brakes. You don't know who makes the starter. You don't know who makes the radio or the air conditioning or all the components in your car. You don't care. All you care about is when you turn the key or these days press the button, you know your car is going to start. Your portfolio is a lot like that. There are a lot of different businesses owned in the portfolio for a greater strategy, a macro strategy. There may be positions we're owning in the portfolio that, frankly, we expect to lose money on because we're hedging our position. We're hedging other companies in the portfolio. So when we look at the top down and we look at the allocation, we're looking at specific industries that we want to own longer term, right? And then plug those into the asset allocation strategy as uh, we move forward. Now you you just use the words longer longer term and I want that so so in the strategy itself with your buy and sell strategy uh, so I hope you don't mind I'm to kind of move to that point here the buy sell strategy it is actually a buy and sell strategy so there are things that you have strategically in the portfolio that you are going to feel more comfortable selling or because so that's that's something that i think that the audience would like to find out because when we talk about the buy sell strategy i think people get the buy strategy but i don't think people are really going to understand the sell strategy would you mind expanding on that yeah for sure so let me begin with a couple of things to help understand uh the buy and sell strategy and, and this is of course part of our overall investment strategy number one in general our portfolio is owned between 25 and 35 companies on average. It fluctuates depending on things that are going on. So we can afford to be picky. People will often ask, what do you think of this company? What do you think of that company? And I always tell people <clears throat> one of the most important lessons about investing, just because a company is a great company doesn't mean it's a great investment, right? So at the end of the day, you can afford to be picky when you're utilizing that top-down, bottom-up approach. Remember, the strategy is like the cake. We've got the top-down, bottom-up strategy. We've got the 25 to 35 companies. We, uh, in general, most of the time, when we make an initial investment, we'll put no more than 5 6%, 7% maybe in any one business when we first start buying it. Doesn't mean we won't buy more but we're going we're gonna to cap the initial investment to reduce risk. Uh, number two, we invest in companies around the world. We don't care where the company is located. We want to own the best companies that are out there based on our asset allocation strategy. And to answer your question about cell discipline, we will uh, utilize strategic cost average, uh, strategic cost averaging. In other words, meaning... We're going to continue. We're going to strategically continue to invest in a company you want to own, and we're going to strategically continue to uh, reduce a position. So let me give you the four uh, fundamental sell disciplines. Number one, we're going to sell a company when the long-term fundamentals are in jeopardy or have changed. No, I don't care if we've made money or we've lost money. We're selling the company because the long-term fundamentals have changed. Number two, we're selling a part of a position to lock in profits to raise cash 
for other opportunities or cash needs. I'll tell you a great story. When I used to do my radio show, um, we would have people call in and I had this guy call in and he said, you know, and we were talking about cell discipline and he said, you know, uh, I bought Intel back in the 90s and I watched that stock ride from seven all the way to 100 and then all the way back down. And he said, it pained me to watch this thing go down. I didn't know when to sell. And my answer to that was nobody knows when to sell. Right. I mean, that's the secret sauce here. You don't know when to sell. What you have to utilize is your sell discipline, which means taking profit off the table. We owned NVIDIA for years. We've owned, we still own AMD for years. These are semiconductor stocks that acted a lot like uh, Intel did. But as those stocks moved up tremendously, two, three, four, five hundred percent over a three, four, five year period, we took profits along the way, locked in gains. By locking in gains, that puts us in a position that even if we don't know when the top is, we already locked in the gains. Mm -hmm. So if we ride a stock from 100 to 10, well, if the long-term fundamentals haven't changed, we may buy more of it. But more importantly, we've already locked in gains. So it's going to take us out of that emotional predisposition of watching a stock go down and have it impact us on an emotional basis. These become very, very important. Another uh, piece of this uh, strategy, as you look at your cake, right, uh, so to speak, we invest in both secular trends and cyclical trends. There are cyclical businesses to own. Historically, semiconductors are a classic example of a secular, uh, uh, a cyclical trend. And then there are secular trends. Uh, you know, when you look at long-term fundamentals, uh, the cloud, for an example, uh, certain technology sectors, uh, certain long-term trends in healthcare, for an example, or in financials. We're going to own, even though financials can be considered a cyclical trend, we're going to look at owning cyclical and long-term trends, and we're going to balance growth and value in that process. So in other words, what I just said in all that, Matt, is like throwing all the ingredients in the cake into the bowl and stirring it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so that makes it fun, doesn't it? Well, it, it makes for a better cake. So long-term fundamentals are in jeopardy. Sell part of the stock to lock in profits. Right. You have cyclical and cyclical trends. What are the other aspects okay, of there's the two other there's two okay. other sell disciplines. Okay, go ahead. Selling a weaker company in favor of a stronger company, less expensive company. This happens most frequently during market corrections or uh, corrections within a sector or in sectors. For an example, COVID is the greatest example I could give you. Uh, when COVID hit, we sold businesses that weren't hammered as bad during the COVID downturn and whose fundamentals were better longer term. So we would sell weaker companies at that point in favor of stronger, uh, lower valuation, long-term companies to own. Uh, we may tax loss harvest, for an example, in businesses. We may sell one oil company, take a tax loss harvest, and buy another one. We may sell one oil company and buy another where the fundamentals are equal, but we're going to take some tax loss harvesting, which basically goes into the for sell discipline, which is taking a loss to offset future gains or to lower the gains in any calendar year. So we have done some tax loss harvesting. It's December right now, right? We've done some tax loss harvesting to reduce some of the gains that our clients have had this year because they've had a tremendous amount of gains the last couple of years. So selling what we can to reduce uh, the gains we've had. There's also some underpinnings going on in the markets today, i.e. inflation, a shift from growth to value stocks, stuff we've talked about in the past. So these four sell disciplines force us to, to literally stick with the process because we know it's process before progress. And it takes the guessing game 
out of the investment process. Well, it also seems to take the emotion out of the process. I mean, you were just talking about the Intel guy who hated the feeling that it went all the way up and all the way back down. Having that process sticking to your knitting and sticking to the fundamental core beliefs that you have at Nepsis takes that emotional component out and I'm assuming provides your clients uh, at least some sort of feeling of of security, if I'm even allowed to say that, uh, because uh, they understand that there's a process involved, which right. I believe, I don't, well, I shouldn't say that. I don't think as many financial services professionals have in place like you do. Is that a fair statement? Oh, it's fair. To, I've never seen anyone at least communicate this, this level of detail to the clients or the marketplace about buy and sell discipline. I mean, when I've sat down with prospects, I've said, hey, Go ask them what their largest holding is. If they can't tell you what the largest holding is in your portfolio, there's no stinking way I'd hire them. <laughs> if, you, if you don't know what your largest holding is and the impact it could have on your overall portfolio and long-term goals, uh, to me, that would seem to be a high-risk situation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, number two, if you don't have a discipline, <laughs> what's the strategy, Right. I mean, I get it. A lot of people want to use, quote unquote, modern portfolio theory, quote unquote. We've talked many times about that whole uh, kit and caboodle. But at the end of the day, it's getting a deeper understanding of the philosophy and strategy that allows the flexibility and transparency to take hold and to uh, accentuate, if you will, the process to which things are happening within the client's portfolio. So all these, you know, long-term uh, secular trends, cyclical trends, dot, top down, bottom up analysis, uh, you know, looking at the highest percentage on your portfolio. Most investors don't even realize, Matt, that their portfolios are so over diversified that the largest holding in their portfolio is like one or 2%. Maybe if they're lucky, it's 3%. Fundamentally, do you understand what your stock has to do to have any meaningful impact to your portfolio. That's why the mentality of the investor is, quote, I invest in the stock market. Well, frankly, yeah, you don't invest in the stock market, you invest in an index. There's a difference. An index is a culmination of a bunch of stocks that are bought and sold in an index. Let me say that one more time. An index is a culmination of a bunch of stocks that are bought and sold in a stock market. So you don't invest in a stock market, you invest in businesses. The question becomes, how much of any given business do you want to own on a percentage basis relative to the rest of your portfolio? And if you want to have a half a percent, one percent, one and a half percent, two percent of your portfolio in any one company and invest in an index, Godspeed, you can do that. But it's like when I talk to people, I talked to a client the other day, I said, what investors don't fundamentally understand, Mr. and Mrs. Klein, is the power of the sell disciplines. This guy who wrote it all the way up, wrote it all the way down, emotionally impacted him, not only emotionally, but also impacted him in the, in the uh, uh, retirement plan because he ended up having a lot less money. Yep. You've got to stick to the asset allocation strategy and that buy-sell discipline along the way. What else do you want to share with us about your strategy before we wrap up today's show? Actually, I think uh, we summed it up pretty good today, boss. I thought you did sum it up really well. That's why I was just kind of opening the door there, man. That was great. I love the idea uh, of that one question. And for those listeners out there, uh, if you are working with another financial services professional, and if you ask them, what is the largest holding? And then the follow-up question, which is what percentage of my portfolio is that largest holding? If they can't answer that, uh, what are they doing? Right. I mean, I just, I don't, Absolutely. I don't know. I just don't know. I think it's one of the most important questions to ask. And then when, you know, and then why now, obviously some, some people may know, let me warn people when they say it's growth fund of America yeah, or it's fidelity, large cap growth, yep. that's not a company. Nope. That is a bucket of companies. Yeah. So if the financial advisor as it happened to me one time when I said to an advisor, what's your largest holding, uh, you know, your largest company holding, he said, growth fund of America. Ugh. I had to tell the poor sap that a fund is not a company. That's right. It, it, it is a bucket of companies. So bear that in mind also. Yeah.
Well, Mark, thank you very much for uh, showing us under the hood. Again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be covering flexibility and transparency, which are the last two parts to the four keys to successful investing. If you did not go back and listen to philosophy, please go back and listen to that. Uh, and it probably uh, isn't a bad idea for you to listen to this puppy again, too, and take some notes because this is a wonderful opportunity for you to change your mind on how you understand what you own and why you own it. And if you don't know that, and you don't know what you own and why you own it, then then we believe that you should probably uh, have a quick call with Mark and his team. All right, Mark, anything else before we wrap up? No, I appreciate the time. Uh, always good to be with you. If you haven't subscribed to the show, please do. If you know somebody who needs to hear it, click that share button. That would be fantastic. And if you don't mind, you can go ahead and give us a quick rating on iTunes or wherever you're listening to the show. So for Mark and everybody at Nepsis, this is Matt Haller, and we'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon. The content discussed is for informational purposes only. It is not a solicitation or recommendation for any securities that may be mentioned herein. Advisory services offered through Nepsis Inc., an SEC-registered investment advisor.